Mr. Bookman here. Before we go ahead and dive into today's audiobook, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you like today's story, make sure you do give us a thumbs up. But as you probably figured, I'm an avid reader, so I don't really get a chance to work out a lot. But I've actually found this new diet pill that guarantees you to lose one pound per day. If you want to check it out, simply just click or copy the link in the description. Now let's get right into the book. Cupid Masquerader by Melville Chater Read for Love Stories, Volume 1 by Anita Sloma Martinez This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cupid Masquerader Dickie was a sentimentalist. He fell in and out of love as naturally and harmlessly as small boys fall in and out of a skating pond. Dickie's flights were erratic as those of a badly teed golf ball. Also like the ball, he was continually smacking up against a bunker. Once, for instance, just as he was starting for a dreamy stroll in the park, his sister, arriving from a tea, new-booted and agonized, hustled him off to make an engagement at Mademoiselle Albert's. The foot of sister was by no means too large for her shoe. Her shoe, she explained, was a trifle too small for her foot. Oh, well, mused Dickie, a sentimentalist like myself has no business in the park anyway. Heaven knows I'm bad enough elsewhere. I look in a greasy pawn shop and reflect that if I bought that old violin and traced it back, its owner might prove to be the one. I take a prosaic swooping elevator and imagine that she is waiting at the twenty-third story. I change at 50th Street for a Harlem train and am suddenly seized with the conviction that she is standing on the 59th Street platform. I lift up the receiver and tremble to think I detect her in the voice which says, 4786 Cortland, busy. So perhaps it's just as well, for I defy even myself to wring sentiment out of a hand and foot hospital. Mademoiselle Albert did not keep a place. She conducted an establishment. When you walked up one flight of moss-green carpet, garnished with silver stair-rods, between two fat rails of burnished brass, you suspected as much. When the plate-glass door was opened by a moss-green, silver-buttoned boy with Albert emblazoned on his collar, and you perceived that you were in the midst of a color scheme, Possibly you sank your voice and felt for a visiting card. Dicky stepped into a long room, carpeted in moss green, upon one side of which stretched voluminous curtains of the same shade, hung on brass rods, through whose crevices could be seen glimpses of hairdressing. Opposite ran a row of white, thin-legged tables, each scattered with glistening manicure instruments and surmounted by a green glorified pincushion, upon one of which lay the hand of a gentleman who was trying to look as if he weren't married, while over his fingertips bent a queenly creature trying to look as if she didn't know otherwise. Another queen, ensconced behind a showcase of powder puffs, hair combs, switches, and other feminine intimacies, greeted Dickie with a dazzling smile and told him that Mademoiselle Albert was engaged. As he waited in the luxuriously couched anteroom, there sounded through the partition a plaintive little drawl that caught him across the chest as agreeably as a deep inhalation from his favorite pipe. "'Oh, quick, Mademoiselle Albert,' pleaded the drawl. "'My foot feels like jelly, calf's foot, that hasn't gelled. A wretched printer's boy, no wonder they're called devils, was wheeling along a big iron thing of type or negatives or something they use on newspapers.' Then, just as I passed, over went to the barrow and out dropped the thing and smashed to pieces on my new patent leathers. The devil wept and called it pie, and he must have been thinking of my toes, for you'll find them in just that condition in the lower left-hand corner of my boot. Whereupon fell eloquent silence, punctuated by ahs and ohs and ouches, which wrung every inch of sentimental dicky six foot two. Suddenly he thrust hands in pockets, turned pettishly away, and frowned out of the window. He scowled down on the pavement, he stared across the street, 
he glanced up at a patch of blue sky as he gazed thereon his face slowly softened and settled into dreaminess mechanically he slipped a hand into his coat pocket and drew forth a turkish slipper a cheap tawdry affair red embroidered with gold as it lay on his extended palm dicky sank his head clutched his chin and gazed with knitted brows he smoothed his fingers lightly almost caressingly over the little slipper and his perplexed look deepened into meditation abstractedly lifting his head he caught in the mirror opposite a full-length snapshot of his lovelorn pose and expression he started his hands fell and he eyed himself in sour disgust ugh he grunted sentimentalist maudlin weak-eyed sentimentalist why can't you fall in love just once in the ordinary sensible way what were you doing last winter at the annual masquerade of the department store's employees sentimentalizing of course and supposing that minnie or mamie or marie or whatever her name might have been was dressed in turkish costume with a yashmak over her face and her eyes peering out atop large and pensive why sentimentality of course brown-eyed dime novel sentimentality and you must beg her to dance though she wasn't dancing at all and asked where she worked whereat she very properly fled in confusion and you must fancy you could discern in her a certain inborn superiority over the rest all of which was errant sentimentality and afterward when you tracked her to the carriage step where she dropped her slippers of course you must pick them up and keep one with some snivelling allusion to cinderella and you must haunt the department stores for the next three months mooning around after every brown eye till even the little cash girls giggled as you passed of course and all for what for some blessed damoiselle of the bargain counter some snub-nosed diana with a pencil through her back hair ah oh, you ass for a silent moment dicky and his reflection glowered ferociously at each other then he squared his shoulders and crushing the slipper in a tense grip slowly shook at himself a revengeful forefinger i'll make an end of you sir now henceforth and forever not another vagary not a single driblet of sentiment and if it's necessary for the common-sense welfare of your soul i'll pick you out a fat widow with six children propose by telegraph bury by telephone and go honeymooning in an automobile and shaking in his reflections face the fist which gripped the slipper he turned resolutely away there was the fireplace but burning leather smells almost as rank to heaven as sentimentality there was the window but some other fool might pick up this oriental talisman and inherit the curse dicky quietly slipped the shoe back into his pocket fantastic even in the flush of his resolution he had decided to give it to the first barefooted person he saw he smiled complacently thanks ever so much broke in the drawl from the next room my toes seem to be on quite firmly again now if you could lend me something to hop downstairs in some old shoe or slipper as mademoiselle albert stepped forth there flashed upon dicky through the half-open door the black silk silhouette of a small foot and ankle the hand that is the foot of fate he gasped and intercepting mademoiselle albert he explained spasmodically i i heard allow me will this do as she passed in holding forth the slipper dicky saw the seated figure lean quickly forward then rise with a little cry following after he suddenly halted trembling beneath a pair of large brown eyes mademoiselle is faint cried mademoiselle albert and when mademoiselle next opened her eyes she found a tall person kneeling before her with a slipper in his hand of course it was town talk and of course thanks to the matchmakers they met that winter in a cotillion at which the favors were of course gilt sceptres and glass slippers and shortly after but of course end of cupid masquerader
by Melville Chater. Mr. Bookman here. I hope you enjoyed today's audiobook. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, but more importantly, if you're looking to lose one pound per day, guaranteed, make sure you check out the description, click or copy that link. And of course, we'll see you next time. And remember, you are appreciated.